Good evening. Let's start the Transportation Advisory Board for the City of Longmont, Monday, August 12th. Let's go ahead and do a uh, roll call. Chair Lehner. Here. Board Member Bennett. Present. Vice Chair McKay Burroughs. Here. Board Member McInerney. Here. Board Member Cockhoffer. Present. And Council Member Yarbrough. Here. Okay. Um, I think we have a new board member, so we'll do introductions. Um, I'll start on, on this side. Hi, my name is Garrison Bennett, and I have been on the board for one year. Hi, my name is Gina mckee Burrows. I've been on the board for also one year. And I'm Steve Lehner, and I've been on the board now two terms. Uh, what are we at here? Uh, four years, I think? This is our fourth. Year. Fourth year, yes. That's what I thought. I'm David McInerney. I'm beginning my fourth year as a board member. Uh, it's been enlightening, and uh, I'm honored to have been reappointed to the board. And I'm Alex Kalkoffer. I've just started. This is my first uh, board meeting, so excited to be here. And I'm Shakita Yarbrough, and I am on city council, and I've been on the board since I've been on city council, um, 2021. Yeah. One more year left. Woohoo! Okay, we'll move to the uh, minutes of the preceding meeting from July. Do we have any comments or corrections to the minutes? Okay, can we get a motion to approve? Motion to approve Transportation Advisory Board meeting minutes for July. I'll go ahead and uh, second that. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Great, let's move on to uh, communications from staff. Phil? Well, we're going way too fast, so <laughs> I've got folks coming at 6.30, 6.45. So um, I'll slow it down, but I'm Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planning Manager with the city, and just wanted to give you some updates. You'll hear a lot of this coming up, but we do wanna make sure that it's stated a couple times tonight that the Transportation Mobility Plan survey is out there. And we'd like everybody to fill that out, even TAB board members and staff members and whoever else needs to fill that out. But we'd like to get some input about the city's transportation um, future, if we could. So that closes on August 23rd, so it'd be great if people could do that. Also, I've heard back from a number of you about the summit, the sustainability or the eighth annual sustainability transportation summit. And so I think I have tickets for the folks that wanted to go. And unfortunately, there's been maybe some crosswires with the emails. So let me know if you haven't received an email yet. I think, Garrison, you're all set because you're under a different piece of this. But uh, um, you're under the freebies, the four freebies. So, uh, But I need to make sure that Gina and uh, Alex both get their emails. So if you don't, let me know quickly. You should get them almost immediately because you're both signed up. I also wanted to chat a little bit about um, the microtransit vendor that we get the question every time we meet. And just to let you know, the contract has still not been signed. So we are waiting for RTD to sign the IGA on their end, to be quite honest with everyone. And once that's signed, we can move forward with the contract and the other piece of this is that I'm very disappointed about is our vendor cannot move forward past a certain point without a contract in hand. So we thought they could do a lot of the stuff up front, but they're not going to be able to. So, um, or they've done as much as they can up front. So I need that contract signed before I can say who it is 
and it might push back our start date. So now we're saying fall of 24 is when we're going to start because of the unknowns here. So other than that, we'll just, um, I think that's all we have from staff. We did know that it's a long meeting tonight. So uh, we'll turn it over back to you for the next item on the agenda. Thank you, Phil. Um, it appears that we don't have any public invited or any public here to speak. Looks like we all have staff. <laughs> okay. Then um, we should uh, we should introduce Dylan. There's Dylan. Dylan's our new. Um, uh, he works in our uh, community outreach group. I don't. I, I'm trying to get the title correct. I'm going to miss it up. Engagement specialist for Vision Zero. So he and Kemi will be working closely together on those uh, issues as we start to move out into the task force. And you'll hear more about that later as well. Thanks. Okay, then I think what we can do is, uh, Phil, do we have the schedule set to start into the CIP? We do. Thank you. <laughs> With that, I'll turn it over to Tom Street. Chair Lehner, members of TAB, Council Liaison Yarborough. My name is Tom Street. I'm with the Public Works and Engineering Department. Tonight I'm here with Aaron Provo. I'm going to stop briefly. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. And uh, we're here to present the city's 2025 to 2029 CIP as it relates to transportation projects. Uh, the focus is going to be on projects with funding in 2025. We presented to TAB during June of this year, so we're going to try not to repeat very much information. We realize we have a, a big agenda tonight, long agenda, so we're going to try to minimize any repeat information. But like always, if you have questions, feel free to jump in at any time. Tonight's uh, presentation on the CIP is much like previous presentations at the end of tonight's uh, event, we're going to ask TAB for a recommendation on the proposed CIP. There's going to be two options as usual. Option one would be recommending the CIP projects as presented by staff. Option two would be recommending the CIP projects as recommended by staff, but with revisions recommended by the TAB. We're going to start off with uh, a brief overview of the city's CIP process. First and foremost, our CIP is a planning document that identifies our five-year infrastructure needs. A project, a capital project, it could be a brand new project, it could be simply a modification to existing infrastructure, so there's different types of capital projects. Our CIP identifies met and unmet needs in that our projects are grouped by funded, partially funded, and unfunded categories within the CIP. And uh, one important aspect to note is that it's a dynamic document. Each year there are some changes, and those changes are in response to changing citywide priorities and changing funding levels. As far as project selection, staff uses a variety of information, different plans, different reports to determine, help determine which projects go into the CIP. We'll use transportation mobility plan at some point. We use Envision Zero. We use tr different types of traffic data. We use the yearly crash reports. We have asset management plans. We have bridge inspection reports. So there's a lot of different information we use to help select which projects go into the CIP. But at a high level, one of our overriding goals is we're trying to develop a connected, a complete, and balanced transportation system throughout Longmont. As far as funding, the city has two different revenues, two different funding sources that are dedicated to transportation. The first is the three-quarter cent street fund sales and use tax. 
The second is our transportation community investment fee. And by far, the most critical funding source for Longmont for transportation is the street fund sales and use tax. Now this varies year by year, but on average, about 70% of our revenues come from this one source, the street fund sales and use tax. So again, very critical for transportation in Longmont. 2025, we have uh, a lot of different types of projects. We have asset management projects. We've got projects that will improve safety, quality of life, that will improve connectivity. We have projects that will improve pedestrian transit, bike facilities, so a lot of different projects. Tonight, we're going to focus on the seven projects up on the slide during our presentation. And I did want to mention that the total request from staff to City Council for 2025 fund is coming in at about $22.6 So we are asking for quite a bit of funding for transportation in Longmont. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Aaron for a slide or two. Thank you. So the intention of this slide is Tom just gave you kind of the overview of the projects we're going to highlight tonight that are funded by the street and TCIF fund, but that doesn't really give the full picture of transportation within the city. So this slide just summarizes some of the other projects that are being managed by different groups within the city that also tie into and support the overall goals and movement in transportation that we're trying to achieve. So we're not going to be able to go into much detail on any of these projects. We mostly want to be able to bring them to your attention to identify that transportation is bigger than our group and we're really working to increase the collaboration among the different groups within the city so that we can make these connections and we can tie in these other projects that are within different pieces of the city so that we are able to produce an overall transportation unit that ties in everyone together. So although these are great snapshots of additional projects that the city is looking is um, investing money in in the next couple of years the focus of tonight's presentation is still going to be on those projects that are funded specifically by street and tcif funding so this table summarizes the funding as we are have put into our, our cip um, these are all of the funded and partially funded projects for 2025 through 2029 as Tom mentioned before, we're going to highlight seven projects specifically, and those are bolded here on this table as well. Um, something that we've added to this presentation that hasn't been, I think, identified quite as clearly in the past is that a lot of the funding that we use to execute these projects comes from grants and um, other agencies. So as we're going through each of these slides, as it's appropriate and applicable, you'll see an additional piece of information for um, external revenue sources. And that identifies what sort of funding we've received from grant sources or from partnerships with different um, groups in order to help fund these projects as they go forward. And so with that, I will pass it back to Tom so we can start going into the individual projects. Okay, our first project is our Asphalt Pavement Management Program, or TRP001, as it's identified in the CIP. This is a yearly program where we have five, six, seven different projects on a yearly basis. And it's a project to where our efforts range from re concrete repairs, repairs of curb gutters and sidewalks, to pavement preservation, to asphalt rehabilitation of the various street segments throughout Longmont. And although it's an asset management program, we also take opportunities to try to add value to our transportation system whenever we can. A couple examples are when we're reviewing projects for the upcoming year, a lot of times there's opportunity to add bike lanes, to improve bike lanes on certain street segments. Another good example will be in 2025, we're going to widen Pay Street from 9th Avenue to 17th Avenue. It's minor widening, it's not a major effort, but we're gonna widen it enough to accommodate bike lanes, new bike lanes along that corridor. Again, it's a project that'll include other scopes of work. There'll be fairly significant drainage improvements and of course, a big asset management component with that particular project. One of our newer projects 
that uh, we'll be rolling forward with that we haven't done in quite some time will be the uh, design and construction of several of our bridge expansion joints. These joints are in rather poor condition. They don't function properly. Uh, we've actually started the design work this year and we expect to replace three of those joint systems next year, 2025. Also on a yearly basis, we always have a number of ADA type improvement projects. And two of our high level goals for the program is we always try to optimize our limited resource funding. You know, we take it very serious that we need to be good stewards of that limited resource, limited funding. And we put a lot of effort into trying to come up with a program a plan that is effective and efficient. Another big goal is we try to make data-driven decisions within this program. We acquire payment inspection data on a regular basis. We use that da data with payment management software to help select which projects are included within this program on a yearly basis. Uh, our program this T1 program really is the cornerstone of maintenance and rehabilitation efforts for Longmont and it's it's really a big effort considering Longmont has over 357 centerline miles of roadway our next project is our transportation system management project program or TSM again this is another yearly program uh, projects can range from safety improvements to neighborhood traffic mitigation type projects. And currently this is where our Vision Zero program is housed. And you'll be hearing more about that program later tonight. Uh, this is a, a program where we've been able to leverage our existing street fund funding. We've been able to acquire several state and federal grants that total approximately four point five million for these TSM projects and in 2025 we're going to see a focus on construction two projects that are scheduled to go to construction are our Sunset Street and State Highway 119 intersection improvement project and our County Line Road shoulder improvement project the shoulder improvement project will widen County Line Road from 17th Avenue north to Colorado 66 and the widening will accommodate on-street bike lanes, but in addition to the widening and the bike lanes, this project will include a variety of other safety, drainage, and asset management type improvements. TRP 92, our Boston Avenue Connection Project. It's a project that's located near the intersection of Boston Avenue, South Pratt Parkway, and the scope for this project includes several different components. The, the key piece being a new at-grade crossing of the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad. Project also includes new pedestrian and bike connections. And this project will help provide support for BRT service within Longmont. The good news is earlier this year, spring of this year, our PUC application, it took quite some time but was finally approved by the Colorado PUC. This approval will permit this particular project to move forward to construction. Right now the design is virtually complete. We're working on two phases. We're working on a phase that will relocate existing utility conflicts and we're working on the acquisition of needed right-of-way and easements for the project. And again, this is another project that uh, we expect to go to construction in 2025. Next project is our railroad quiet zone project. This project will be ongoing for the next couple of years. It has a couple different primary components. It has certain safety benefits, but it's really a quality of life improvement. The primary goal of this project is to address community identified needs and implement a city council priority by greatly reducing train horn noise throughout Longmont. This will be accomplished by the design and construction of certain supplemental safety measures, such as the installation of railroad gates 
at all four quadrants of certain rail street intersections. Again, it sounds like a fairly straightforward project, but the coordination behind the installation of those improvements is rather cumbersome. We need to coordinate with the PUC, the FRA, Federal Railroad Administration. The railroad, big item, Burlington Northern Santa Fe. I uh, don't want to say much beyond that. And CDOT, so a lot of coordination, a lot of effort is going into the approvals of the design for this project. And admittedly, we did have a setback this year. This project went to bid during spring, late spring of this year. When we opened bids, I should say one bid, we had only had one bid, it was significantly over our budget. So since that time, we've been refining the scope of work. And we're at a point now where I think we're going to be able to go back out, test the waters, rebid the project in about a month to a month and a half. Uh, as far as 2025 work, we expect package two to go to construction next year. And package two will consist of five different crossings. We're looking at 4th Avenue, 5th Avenue, 6th Avenue, 21st Avenue, and Terry Street. So by the end of next year, we're hoping that uh, package one will be constructed and there'll be significant progress made on package two. Quick question. <clears throat> Do you hope to have more than one bidder this next rollout? Hope is extremely high. Uh, what we've done is we've, uh, we've added um, uh, some additional design information to the plans. One of the big items was the type of shoring that was needed for certain utility work next to a railroad. As you can imagine with a, with a, a railroad with the trains going by and you're, you're digging a hole you really have to support that hole in a very serious way and our initial attempt we left some of that up to the design of a contractor who would be selected for the project this go around we're designing that type of shoring ourselves and will be included in, it in the bid package but i think with that additional design information I think we're bidding at a more favorable time of the year too. So we're, we're very hopeful that we'll have more than one bidders and more than anything that we're going to have competitive bids. Next project is TRP 131. It's our first and main transit station project. This is a project where we've uh, entered into a partnership with RTD. RTD is coming to the table with about $16.5 million. Again, this is another project that uh, will help support BRT within Longmont. And currently, we're uh, designing improvements to a new segment of Kaufman Street. Uh, the segment that uh, we're working on will be from First Avenue South to Boston Avenue. The design for those improvements is about 30% complete, and in addition to the roadway improvements, uh, there will be new pedestrian and bike improvements, including a two-way cycle track along the west side of Kaufman Street. And this is a project that we're expecting, we're scheduled to go to construction in 2026. At this point, I'm gonna turn it back over to Aaron. The next project we have on our list is TRP-135. Um, on here and in the, the transportation world, it's identified as Kaufman Street Busway, but it's also known as the Kaufman Street Mobility Improvement Project. Mm -hmm. This is a continuation of what's already under construction from 2nd to 9th Avenue. And so the funding being requested for the years 25 and 26 is for the design of first to Second Avenue, as well as some contingency in place for the construction of Second to Ninth. So this portion of the project carries on the the priorities of the other piece that's already underway, and extends the multimodal improvements, um, and carries on the um, the pedestrian and and bike safety amendments that have been made on Kaufman already. It's also an asset management program in the way that. Um, asset, excuse me, asset management in the way that the pavement on Kaufman is 
showing signs of distress and so this is going to be able to address that as well and be able to take over um, the improvement of that area and that whole corridor and this will also is one of the connecting pieces between TRP 131 that Tom just spoke about um, and helps tie in some filling in some of those missing links that the city is working to fill so the design is uh, a bit over 30 percent complete so far so funding for next year will help um, continue on that design to then uh, aim to target construction beginning in early 2026. The last project we have on our list is TRP 137. This is focused on the intersection of 21st and Main. It's a portion that com comes out of our uh, Main Street corridor plan. Um, it was identified as a um, catalyst site in the northern part of town and its emphasis is on multimodal improvements and prioritizing vulnerable users to convey them through the intersection in a more meaningful way. We've been um, the recipient of a Dr. Cog fund to first do a study in order to gather information, um, be able to have conversations with the residents in the area to better understand how they use the intersection, where they're going, what they're hoping to see, and really find ways to make sure that portion of the community is heard. And then as um, out of that study phase, we'll then proceed forward with the preferred alternative that will carry through in design that we expect to start in early 2025. Depending on what comes out as the preferred alternative through that process, we will then seek funding at a later time for construction as it's appropriate for the scope of the project. So at this time, um, that concludes the highlight of the projects we wanted to bring to your attention for 2025, and we'd like to open up for, for any questions you may have. All right, thank you for your, um, all this information. I'm very excited about the 21st and Main multimodal improvements. That'll make my bike commute uh, all the more better. And so uh, thank you for that. I, uh, I'm i curious to know more about the 1st and Main project. And um, is there, so I, I visualize it being kind of like the Boulder Junction um, facility where it there'll be like an indoor place for bus, uh, for passengers waiting for the bus or train. Um, is that correct? Uh, is there going to be additional parking? Or is this like something that is uh, still in the works of figuring out? Those are all great questions. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn that one over to Phil. Phil is uh, <laughs> extremely well versed on, I think, virtually every question that you asked. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Um, Board Member Bennett, the I, I guess the comparison that I would make for the the first and main station that we're planning for Longmont is more like downtown Boulder. So the buses will all be at grade. So they'll come into a parking garage where they will uh, stop and hub, basically, and you'll be able to do your transfers all at that street level. But it'll be underneath the parking levels and the different aspects that'll be multi-use. So there'll be the residential component most likely and then some commercial retail spaces close by as well. There'll also be, we're planning a restroom, a public restroom, which is always a dangerous thing, but um, <laughs> public restroom and then uh, <laughs> and then also a bike, a bike storage facility. So we'll have locked bicycle facilities. You lock your bike inside and then there, there'll be like the cage that we see uh, at Ethan Kaufman. So, there's a couple aspects to it, but there will be a number of levels of parking associated with that above. And will these facilities be mostly owned and managed by RTD or Longmont? We plan on Longmont managing all the facilities and having control of the roadway out front. So no part, uh, not too much of it will be controlled by RTD, but they'll obviously have a say in how the operations happen underneath in, within their garage area, within the garage area, not theirs, but they will be in charge of maintaining it, I would imagine, similar to some other facilities that we have around town. And are there other stakeholders that have a vested interest in the first and main project, like Transport or Bustang or, um, uh, or Greyhound? Transport for sure does have a vested interest because they will likely use that facility 
as well as the rest of the buses. Um, the others, we have not heard that uh, that Mustang wants to come into Longmont yet, as far as maybe going along 287, but that, that is a possibility in the future. With, uh, with the limited resources that RTD has, we are turning more of our attention to the to the state facilities of the state um, state run transit. So Colorado 7 is looking at it right now and we'll look at it for 287 as well. But at this point, the bus staying activities will be out on I-25 and 119. Those are actually start serving that transit hub uh, this fall. And so we're hoping that we can, we're actually planning to have our microtransit serve that area for bus staying service. Cool. Also, um, separately, uh, so the Firestone Longmont Park and Ride uh, and Bus Stop for the Bustang, uh, when will that be, uh, when will Bustang actually have, a, have services there? Do you know? Sorry, that, that's, that was what I was trying to reference, and yes. I apologize for not being clear, but that will start, they're saying fall of this year as well, so I've heard October. Okay. Yeah. I eagerly await. Thank you. Um, and then, uh, any other questions? Oh, yes. So for the TRP 92 Boston Avenue connection, um, the will the uh, crossing over the, um, yeah, uh, yes, going over that, yes. So with this design, um, will this also be quiet zone compliant? Yes, it will. It's following the same process with the different stakeholders as our quiet zone project. So, but yeah, in the end, it is quiet zone compliant. Love that. All right. And those are the questions that I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have some notes on some of the other projects as well that you didn't talk about tonight. Would that be okay if I have some comments about those ones too? Considering the amount of staff that we have here tonight, I'm guessing <laughs> that we're in good position to answer most questions. It may okay. not be the two of us, but we have a lot of staff here. Okay, thank you. Um, so I guess my first question, which is kind of um, an obvious question probably, but from the drawings that I've seen for the first and main transit se station, is that going to be between first and second, or is it going to be first and Boston? Between first and Boston. Okay, I thought so, but then or I was between Boston and first. Okay, so um, the TRP zero ninety two, I think it is, where um, you're doing improvements on Boston. Um, is that going to um, link into the transit center eventually so that you can enter into the transit center and not have to, like pedestrians and bicyclists I'm really thinking of, and they can use the Boston Avenue as an entrance to the transit center? TRP 92, our Boston Avenue connection project is providing a certain missing link, missing link of the roadway that'll connect Boston Avenue to the west, to Boston Avenue to the east, and provide access to the first and main area. Okay. So Additionally, the Kaufman Street project that we talked about the, the section from first to second, and we talked about the ongoing pro the project that's already started, that's second to ninth, so that's under construction now. First to second is what this is talking about in TRP 135. There's another segment that we didn't talk about necessarily, but it's the section south of first to Boston that was mentioned before. That makes a connection, bicycle pedestrian connection all the way to the Greenway. So that brings the Greenway connection up th up Kaufman to Boston. So you can go continue on Boston, but really you would probably stay on the Greenway most likely to go east-west. So the, the Greenway connection really brings you north-south into downtown. Okay, that was really what the question I was getting at was. I, I know you already knew my question. <laughs> um, so, um, I can't remember. I wrote down the name, the numbers, so I don't remember which <laughs> which project it refers to. TRP1119? Um, I can't remember. Oh, yeah, here we go. Yeah, the Third Avenue, West Van Bridge. Um, so, I was just wondering how that project is going to be impacting the pedestrian and bike paths. 
since you're redoing the bridge work, I think. Is that going to be widening that? Because um, it's kind of a narrow over bridge, over the bridge for pedestrians and bikes. So I was just wondering if that's going to change. We're at a point where we do not have a lot of the detail that you're asking about. But what I can tell you is this particular bridge structure most likely will take a kind of a rehabilitation approach. We believe that the substructure is in pretty good shape. It's just the top of the bridge, the superstructure that is showing a lot of signs of distress. So right now our, our concept would be we'll take the top half of the bridge out, off and redesign, reconstruct it. And as far as pedestrian bike connections, those types of things, once we get into the design, actual hands-on design work, we'll certainly be looking at those type of items. But I will add, when it comes to city infrastructure, probably one of the sets of infrastructure that the city has that is in an overall good condition, it's our bridges. This is one of the few bridges where we have an issues at. Okay, thank you. Um, TRP 121, so that's the Ken Pratt Highway 119 improvement, um, which I see is going to be starting in 26, uh, but it's fully funded. Um, so I'm just wondering how necessary are the additional left turn lanes for northbound, southbound, eastbound? Because adding additional lanes is kind of counter the direction the city seems to be going in and trying to reduce the amount of cars on road. So I'm just wondering about those turning lanes. Turning lanes. Yes, um, part of the original design for that, the, the original design piece of that was to add the capacity to that roadway just due to the traffic. The other piece of it was safety. So trying to eliminate some of the crash pieces that we have if, as far as that goes as well. But the the idea is that we would somehow grade separate that boulder bound um, direction of travel. So that opens it up to um, allow some of the lanes to work a little bit better if the if there's if we put we have three lanes to receive on northbound hover so we we're going to put in try to put in those triple lefts if we can and we haven't there's been no design part that's really been finalized at this point but that was the initial look at it so through the rest of the design we do have a very robust um, the bus transit bus rapid transit piece will stay in the right lane and they'll actually get their own signal to turn into that receiving lane as well, that third receiving lane on northbound Hover. So part of that is how do we take care of some of the capacity needs that we have? And the intersections are where, where we see the issues. So if we do some capacity improvements at the intersection, we think we can get the traffic through and the links we won't have to widen then because you'll get the traffic through and it's more efficient. It's, it's going to be a more efficient system to get it through the intersection and not widen the actual facilities north, south, east and west, kind of southeast or southwest and northeast of that. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to facilitate all the different needs of that intersection. We've got the bike piece, which is probably going to be a grade separated piece on the north leg. And then we've got the um, the crash issues, second, probably our second worst intersection. So those are the things that we're trying to mitigate with the extra lanes. Sorry, I think I butchered that, but Tom, Tom gave me the wink, so I'm good. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, on that same intersection, have you considered changing out for a roundabout? Well, the original concept, when we did the conceptual planning of this intersection, we did throw two different roundabouts. One was called a peanut about, because <laughs> it looked like a peanut. It was two pieces uh, together. And then one was a more traditional, larger roundabout. And just with the utilities and all the different things that are going on there, that's one of the reasons why we've had to give up on the most likely we'll have to give up on the underpass mm -hmm. uh, portion that's boulder bound because there's just too much on that north west leg or that, that west leg of the intersection to make it work. So we had the same issues with some of the roundabout pieces that we looked at. And it wasn't taking care of uh, all the capacity constraints that we had because it, would, it was going to have to be so large. Okay. Ask if it's still grade separated if they said the south yeah. is... is <laughs> Is it still going to be separated then if you're not doing an underpass? We are going to try to. We are currently in negotiations with CDOT to do an overpass. That's their okay. preferred alternative at this point, but we haven't finalized anything. We'd like to make sure we take that to 
both the TAB and the City Council uh, when they start to come further with uh, some recommendations that are more finalized. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, is that same in, is that um, the same intersection? Is that going to be impacting the bike parking facility that's right there on that corner, the covered one on South Hope? What we're trying to do with that with that uh, whole facility on the north side, if you think of both sides of Hover mm -hmm. as having bike separated bike facilities, I mean they're not. Um, one has some issues with driveway crossings. The one to the I'll say to the north and east has some driveway crossings, but it's a very it's a it's a very good separated bikeway from the road, so that works very well. And then think of a grade separation, then either going under or over that north leg of Hover and connecting with the bike trail that I think you're talking about, mm -hmm. close to like the Texas Roadhouse and the Eye Care yeah. Center and all those mm -hmm. pieces. That will provide that continuous then continue continuous bikeway that will then connect underneath the boulder bound 119 travel lanes that's already part of the project and that'll get you right to the center of the 119 bikeway corridor so that'll connect you to the bikeway so that'll be one continuous connection piece that you won't have to stop as a bicyclist to make that connection oh, okay. sorry long-winded but no that's that thank you for answering um i don't i don't yeah it sounds like you haven't got to the design well you're working on the design still so is there any thought to um, extending out, adding in separated bike lanes along Hover, further north or further south, as part of that same project? At, at this point, uh, that's not really part of the scope of work with the project with CDOT. At this point, uh, CDOT has taken the lead on the design and construction of this project, and currently the project is um, not fully funded so they're really looking at uh, different options as far as trying to close that gap but at this point the uh, the bike lanes the improvements you're talking about is not part of the scope but we would have connections to the bike or the side paths that are part of the roadway so those side paths that go on either side of Hover those would both be connected into this facility that's not great but it's um, it's going to be a good connection, I believe, for folks who um, want to ride that facility and get on that facility and get into Longmont as well. Yeah, uh, the reason I'm asking is that there's no real good connection between like um, Left Hand Creek Greenway to like Dry Creek. Like you have to go along Hover or you have to go all the way down 119 and then join back up and come back around. So that's why I was asking about the Hover connection because that's definitely a missing connection, I feel like, in my, my mind. And even up to St. Brain as well, eventually. A good alternative route will be once we complete our Ken Pratt Boulevard State Highway 119 Sunset Intersection project, including our road diet. That'll change the striping on Sunset from State Highway 119 to Nelson Road. We'll provide access to our new Greenway project on Dry Creek That'll extend the greenway from sunset going west and provide another connection over to Hover. So it won't be as direct as what you're talking about. But within a couple of years, that alternative will be available. Okay. Thank you. I know I have lots of questions. Um, TRP 131. Um, it sounds like some... I was just reading through the um, packet, and it sounds like there's higher costs than anticipated, which I'm sure always happens. And I was just wondering if you had already found those, that funding for the additional costs, or are you still looking to fill that gap that's still missing? I don't have detailed information for you. Our project manager for the project as a whole I know he's looking at alternatives. Phil may have some additional information. I know they're looking at creative financing methods to close the gap on that project. But at this point, as far as having sufficient funding to finish the new roadway connection, including the pedestrian and bikeway improvements, we do have funding to finish that 
component, that part of the project. Yeah, as Tom mentioned, we do have some creative financing going on, and a lot of it's developer-driven. So we're bringing the $16.4 million from RTD, which was promised about 10 years ago now. And uh, we've got money that is going to be coming from the city budget for that. Not enough to fill the full gap, but then working with a developer to start talking about uh, public-private partnerships mm -hmm. that will help fill those gaps. Okay. Um, so on TRP 98, um, I know that's only partially for that's but that's way down the list of what you're going to be doing, but the widening of 66, I would be really suggesting don't widen 66 at all. And instead of adding just a bike lane, make it a separated bike lane. Cause as a cyclist, I would never go on 66, even with a bike lane needs to be completely separated because those cars are going 60 miles an hour so I am not going to be riding my bike even if there is a bike lane I'm sure many other cyclists would feel the same so instead of adding an extra lane for cars take that space instead and make a separated bike lane is my suggestion the design for that particular project is at about the 30 percent level at least a year ago, we encountered a fairly serious drainage issue overtopping of State Highway 66, and we've been working on solutions for that particular issue since that time. It, it's going to need to involve a partnership with some of the adjacent property owners to the north, but currently included with that scope of work, there are two wide paved shoulders on each side of Colorado 66 that will be constructed when those con improvements are constructed. But in addition, on the south side, along the Longmont frontage, there will be an offset sidewalk that will be constructed that will close all of the existing gaps from Hover going to the east. Okay. Is there still a plan to widen 66? Once we get past, if we get past the current design issue, and once funding is available, there would be some widening of 66 to accommodate the wide paved shoulders, some turn lanes, other features. But not adding extra lanes? Uh, there would be some additional laneage added as part of the project. Okay. Um, so you're mentioning about the... Um, separated um, multi-use path, basic, essentially. When there's going to be um, traffic lights or uh, potential crossings across 66, how is that going to be um, accomplished with that, with the maximum safety in mind for those pedestrians and bikers getting over 66 potentially? Yeah. Currently, with the current design concept, 30% design level, the offset the multi-use path they're referring to will only be on the south side of of Colorado 66 and at some point in the future there will be signalized intersection in particular at Francis Street so at some point when that corridor those intersections meet warrants there will be a traffic signal that will be installed that will help those crossings as far as from the south side to the north side okay so it doesn't sound like there's, right now there isn't a big plan to do that. Well, also on the, on the Envision Longmont plan, you'll see a planned underpass along that corridor too. It's, right now it's planned so it can move, it could, it could move, but it's not part of this project, I'll be honest with you on that, but it is part of our comprehensive planning for the future. So we do understand that need. Uh, right now there's still a school site planned for north in this northern neighborhood, the Terry Creek, uh, Terry Lake neighborhood. So there's a park, there's there's homes, so we do want to make sure that uh, try to eliminate the barriers as best we can. And with the one signal, uh, we had planned on there probably being more, uh, another signal as well, a second signal in between Hover and Main Street and the underpass, part of the plan, again, long range plan. Okay. But, uh, answer your question, the uh, funding for this project, TRP-098, it's, um, you know, we do not have construction funding at this point, and the schedule is not defined yet. Okay. 
um, TRP105, I'm not saying, oh, there it is, missing sidewalks. Um, I know this is an ongoing project for the city and it's a ever moving target to mi fill in all these missing sidewalks, but if there's any way to accelerate the project so that it gets more higher priority on the funding list, I mean, these, some of these sidewalks have been missing for many, many years at this point and in line with trying to reduce, uh, increase safety and accelerating um, adding those sidewalks I would be really in favor of. So moving that forward in the funding schedule. You are certainly correct that some of the sidewalk gaps that we have in Longmont have existed for quite some time. I think one of the difficulties we've been having with the street fund over the last three, four, five years is we're seeing a lot more stress. We're, we're, we're not having the ability to make ends meet to be able to fully fund all of our projects. I think from a staff, staff perspective, we agree with you. T-105 missing sidewalks is an important project, but at this point with our highest priorities, and it's, it comes down to a directive from our city manager that some of our construction projects, we need to get constructed, we need to finish certain projects, then at that point, my guess is there may be more funding available for these sidewalk projects. Okay. Um, TRP 123 with the Nelson Road improvement. Again, it looks like you're planning on adding extra lanes again. And just like with 66, I would be not in favor of adding extra lanes because that just means you can't add things like separated bike lanes, which I think would be better use of that space. At, at this point, uh, yeah, we're not sure what the concept is going to look like. I think it's going to be dependent on a couple different factors including Phil's transportation mobility plan, and our initial funding is to develop a concept in preliminary engineering. So we're, we're not even coming close to a point where I can answer that and say, hey, we're adding lanes. But uh, at some point coming up in 26, we'll be able to start laying it out and see what options seem to make sense. Okay, that's just, I was just doing it based on the description, right, the, the adding extra lanes. A sense point. Um, TRP 124. Um, it sounds like there's, again, it's still partially funded, so it's still a ways away. Um, but similar to other comments I've had, widening and adding extra lanes, I would much prefer to explore things like adding a roundabout instead of for that um, intersection. TRP 124, I think if you remember correctly, at this exact t same time last year, we, we took quite a bit of heat from the TAB <laughs> for, for our current design. Since that time, what we decided was to push it out a year or two. And what we're going to do, we're going to retool our approach. We're going to take a second look. We're going to try to take a deeper dive in how to make that intersection more pedestrian, more bike and more transit friendly. So yeah, it is it is pushed out, but based on input guidance from the TAB last year, yeah, we're gonna take a second look at it. Okay, great, thank you. I promise I'm almost done. <laughs> um, it sounds like the uh, TRP 137 is a, like a multi-step process because you're working on the 21st of Main um, section right now, which um, sounds pretty exciting because that is one of the most dangerous intersections in Lamont, so examining that seems like makes a lot of sense to me. Um, in some of that examination and the exploring and uh, discussing with the uh, uh, community members, have you thought about changing the intersection completely and making a roundabout instead of a traffic light? So at this stage, we're still doing a lot of data analysis, a lot of collection. So we're going to be gathering input from community members and um, our consultant that we have on board for it. Um, I think a roundabout is something that to be considered. I'm not sure if CDOT would be in such a favor of that along 287. So we also have to balance their restrictions, their desires through that corridor. Um, so we're really trying to take an open mind 
coming into this project and really trying to consider and explore a lot of the different safety implementations that we can use and whether it is a complete overhaul or whether it's more impactful, smaller adjustments, but the overall goal is still to achieve a much higher safety and a much more of a, a safe feeling for people to be able to move through that intersection. So roundabout can certainly be something we would consider. However, getting CDOT on board might be a bit more of a challenge. Okay. I mean, just given the fact that the safety issue, like roundabouts will reduce the number of incidents by a significant factor. So maybe that might be enough to con convince CDOT that it would be synced to push forward more. I don't know. We are trying to, as Tom mentioned earlier, we're trying to make a very um, a lot of data-driven decisions. So if um, the data shows that that really is the best solution, then we will be able to support that and make that claim to CDOT, I'm sure. But okay. it's gonna be, we're going to rely on the data gathering and really trying to make use of um, our consultant gathering information as well as the input from our Vision Zero team and utilizing all the resources we have to us to find a solution that's efficient and truly makes a difference in that portion of town. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I think that's all my comments, actually. <laughs> I'm sorry for my many comments, but I just wanted to uh, make sure that they were mentioned, even if it, they were partially funded, just because I know it kind of affects the way you think moving forward, so I just wanted to bring those uh, points of view, even if it's a future project. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much for your presentation. Me. Sorry. How's this? Yeah, thanks very much for the presentation. Um, my comments and questions also are not limited to just the seven projects that you've presented. Um, starting with the funded projects, um, Boston Avenue Connection, Price to Martin, TRP092. The project sheet only describes the final condition of the connection. What will be accomplished with the $350,000 allocated for next year? In our current year, 2024, we have funding for that project. But based on our most recent cost estimate, we're seeing a small gap so that additional funding in 2025 is essentially construction contingency, just in case we need it. Okay, um, moving on to the first and main transit station area improvements, TRP 131. Um, it's clear that RTD will fund up to $16.4 million for that project. Now, the, the project sheet, paragraph two, uh, sentence three, indicates that the city will set aside $7.45 for property acquisition. I'm guessing that means $7.45 million. But does that mean that the city's only financial obligations are for property acquisition and construction cost overruns on that project? No, the city will. The, the city has other obligations for the kind of the bulk of that project. The sixteen point four million is probably just going to kind of cover what's needed for. It can only cover, quite frankly, because it's fast tracks dollars. It can mm -hmm. only cover things that are related to the transit facility. So it can't. It can't cover redevelopment and all those different things that we're going into. But the property acquisition has to happen for Kaufman Street to happen, and the transit facility to happen. So any kind of cost that are related to those pieces, we can charge under the fast tracks dollars. But will the city also be paying for infrastructure upgrades, utility work, and things like that? We will where we need to, but we're also going to count on RTD because without the bus rapid transit and the rail connection and that whole piece of the idea that this is a transit facility that's supposed to serve fast tracks, uh, we'll use the dollars as much as we possibly can on the infrastructure as well, but you, you, you're correct that the city's gonna pay, probably pay the bulk of that because we can't use fast trucks dollars to a certain point. We have to be very careful. You might wanna double check that project sheet before you present it to city council, just to make clear what the, the city's responsible for paying for. Uh, moving on to uh, partially funded projects. 
Transportation System Management Program, TRP-011. I've noted that this includes um, Vision Zero implementation. I think that's great. Um, year one, that's next year, shows $500,000 of un unfunded projects under the street tax funds. Does that mean that there are identified Vision Zero projects that are going unfunded in 2025? No, I don't believe that uh, we can make that assumption quite yet without full development of the Vision Zero program. The unfunded portion that you're referring to, I believe is a traffic signal that we were considering, but we just could not make the overall budgets for the street fund to work. So we had to make certain cuts and that $500,000 reduction was for a certain traffic signal system that uh, we would like to have, you know, designed and constructed next year, but uh, we don't have funding for. Okay, uh, understood. So that makes it seem like there won't be any money allocated for Vision Zero improvements until the Vision Zero plan process has been completed? Well, a, a detailed plan. I think what you're saying, there's some truth in that. But as far as next year's budget, we've allocated 500000 for initial Vision Zero improvements. So that's, that's set aside within the overall ask for 2025. Great, that's good to hear. Uh, Nelson Road and Hover Street intersection improvements, TRP 124. My board colleague, McKee Burroughs, has already addressed this intersection or project at length. I'm just wondering, as it's described on the project sheet that's in our packet, it seems like a pedestrian would have to traverse eight lanes of traffic to cross over if if it's built out the way it's described in the project sheet is is that correct uh, that's true and that's part of what we're going to go back and, and take a second look at trying to figure out how to decrease that crossing distance it may involve change in laneage along hover street but again we're going to push that project out, and when we pick it back up, we're going to try to come up with concepts that would make it much more friendly for pedestrians. Right. Well, eight, crossing eight lanes sounds kind of intimidating to me. So if you are going to present it to council the way it shows on that project sheet that you put in our packet, I'd recommend that you uncheck the boxes that say balanced transportation and livable corridors because it's really not friendly to the most vulnerable users of our street system. Um, all right, M my next question about that project um, is directed to a traffic engineer. Would that be you, Aaron, or Kyle? <laughs> that would be Kyle. That would be Kyle, okay. I noticed that uh, on the project sheet, the. A big part of the rationale for this improvement is safety. And there's a reference to a lot of rear-end collisions at that intersection. Kyle, are you familiar with research that indicates that adding lanes to an already congested roadway or intersection is at best a very short-term improvement? Um kind of a yes and no, no answer. So when we're looking at capacity of a roadway, generally in the, I'll take a freeways for instance, adding more lanes doesn't necessarily decrease the delays or congestion of a roadway. However, increasing lanes um, at an intersection does increase some capacity through the intersection as you can reduce those start delays. Um, so start delays are when you have two cars stacked upon each other. Um, and it accounts for the reaction time of each driver. So you'll notice when you, or if you want to look at traffic as you're going home, if one car starts, maybe a second later, the next car starts, and that gap between each car gets longer and longer and longer, more lanes will result in getting more cars through because you have less delay. Um, but overall, as a capacity issue as a full corridor. Um, there's some research that supports it, um, but it really depends on 
um, timing and kind of the rest of the corridor's um, character. So is it your position that that would be a long-term safety improvement, adding those lanes? Um, I think that's the reasoning why we're reconsidering the intersection um, based on recent years and direction from council and city manager to really look at our Vision Zero program and redefine what it is to be a uh, driver, pedestrian, bicyclist of Lamont. And this project started before we had that direction. Uh, so what Tom alluded to is we're going to look at it and really come back with a plan that shows that balance between a Vision Zero moving vehicles, cars, and pedestrians in a safe manner. Mm -hmm. And, well, and I'll have more information for um, the tab board next month about some traffic signal improvements around the city um, that would hopefully ease some concerns as well. Yeah, thanks very much, yeah, Carl. Carl. Yeah, I'm no traffic engineer, but it seemed to me that if, if you have six congested lanes now and a lot of rear end collisions, and you add a couple more lanes, in a few years you might have eight congested lanes with even more opportunities for rear end conditions. And that would uh, undermine perhaps the safety argument for this project. Uh, moving on to the Main Street Corridor Plan. I think that is great. That looks like a great project to me. Um, under unfunded projects, Ken Pratt Boulevard, South Pratt to Nelson, TRP 120. Um, comments similar to the ones that I and uh, my colleague McKee Burroughs have made regarding the utility of adding lanes to already congested roadways and intersections. Um, if I could just add real quick, yeah. sorry. That, that project is really converted over time into more of what we consider uh, business access transit lanes as the addition. We don't have the, f the resources to even start talking about that project anymore. That's why it's unfunded. But when we last visited this project, the idea was not to convert them into through, through lanes, but to add them as what's called business access transit lanes, bat lanes. Uh, and that's where you would have a transit vehicle that could go straight through and all the, all the other vehicles accessing the businesses would have to turn at the driveway. They couldn't continue going forward. So just to clarify that project and how it's, some of these descriptions, I'll be honest with you, are holdovers and we've, it's, they're difficult to change. And so some of them have kept, you know, the different lane configurations at 119 and Hover, those, those things kind of stick with the project throughout, mm -hmm. but they are changing and they're being modified. And there are um, nuances to all these projects that aren't, caught in the the write-up so i just want to throw that out there as i see as, and i also wanted to say i messed up and i said that there was an underpass on 66 that's been pulled off of our comprehensive plan so i just want to be clear about mm -hmm. that issue too thank you so has a project ever been removed from the cip or do they all just get pushed out to the future and stay on the on the program through the years, a lot of projects have been removed from the CIP. If, you know, after five, ten years, we take a hard look at it and it just doesn't seem to be feasible, the cost-benefit ratio is just not attractive, projects have been removed. Okay, thanks. And that one project on 119 or Ken Pratt Boulevard, that was there as the bus rapid transit corridor originally, and then... We started talking about Boston and making that connection. And if we got the connection on Boston across the railroad tracks, that could then become the bus rapid transit corridor. So now we're at that level. So we will need to reevaluate re some of these projects as they move forward. Okay, that's the next one on my list. Hover Street Improvements, Ken Pratt Boulevard to Boston Avenue, TRP 122. The project sheet appears to call for design in 2028 and 2029. But the uh, uh, TRP 124 suggests that the improvements are going to be constructed in 2026 and 2027. Am I missing something there? It looks like the construction comes before the design when you look at those two project sheets. I think part of the confusion may be the fact that 
the design of Hover Street was broken into three different phases and included within TRP 122, but the construction of the intersection, Nelson and Hover, is is solely within TRP 124. So there may there may be some confusion there. Okay. Uh, some of the, uh, our board members may recall that last year I asked about some um, uh, some projects that involve uh, municipal building renovations that are included under the uh, street tax revenue allocations. And these are projects that don't have a TRP prefix designation in their project numbers. Um, last year I asked about boiler replacement, HVAC replacement, and flooring replacement. And we were informed that the reason those projects get funded from the street tax revenues is that city transportation employees work in those buildings. Is that? That is correct. Correct. Okay. This year we have added uh, municipal building roof improvements, PBF001. So I'm guessing that the rationale is the same there. Yes. Okay. And, and other, other funding sources for those improvements include the water fund, uh, sanitary sewer fund as well. So it isn't just the street fund. So mm -hmm. they go to the, all the enterprise funds, including storm drainage, storm fund, uh, for where those, uh, I use the example of the, the, the Development Service Center, DSC building. We house all the engineers who work on not just streets, but uh, our planning review, uh, and then some of our water engineers as well. I see. Uh, this year, I want to ask about a couple of other PBF projects. Uh, the first one is PBF 192, which is Operations and Maintenance Building Site Improvements. There's $372,500 allocated for next year. What's that project? That is the uh, improvements to the airport road operations facility. That is where we house our, uh, basically our operations group. That's the team that does uh, pothole repair, um, does storm drainage, snow plowing. That's where, that is their operations center. So almost all of our equipment is housed out of that uh, facility. Um, and uh, it, um, it, is, it also is funded through water and, and the storm fund as well. Okay. And then under unfunded for... 2026 there's almost four million dollars for the uh, operations and maintenance building site improvements what specifically are those improvements so the 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 funding for 2025 is for layout design permitting for those site improvements so they're looking to expand that facility uh, into to the to the west I believe uh, where the dog park is located so that is um, under the um, purview of, uh, although it is a dog park, which is Parks and Rec, uh, it is property owned by Public Works. So that includes um, some improvements. I'd have to, to bring it back as to what we're proposing, uh, but we need a, currently need to improve our wash bay uh, for our vehicles. All of our street sweeping, currently we, we take it out to a facility off of 119. Um, so we're looking to reduce those drives, uh, but it is improvements that will assist with our operations. Does it involve new buildings? Four, um, mil it, four million is uh, quite a large sum. Yeah, I think it involves an, um, one new building, one new facility. Okay. And then also um, PBF 221, the solar voltaic system installation. It's uh, Funded for no, it's unfunded for one hundred and twelve thousand dollars. What's that? Um, I think it's more of a dream. But the, as the uh, a few years ago, as the city was getting into um, the climate emergency and looking for other ways to augment our power sources and electricity, uh, they came up with some ideas for um, installing solar facilities on some of our buildings. So they were looking to to put that into a CIP. 
um, realizing that it may not be as viable as they first planned and really not having the funding for it, which is why it sit, is sitting in an unfunded uh, category. Okay, but it's in an unfunded category that would be funded by street tax revenues. What's the nexus to transportation for the solar? It would be located uh, similar to the other um, building uh, items. It would be on a, a facility that was uh, controlled by the street fund and would benefit the street fund. Meaning? City employees, city transportation Where employees it, might it may work be, in the building on yes, which the panels. Yes, on which installed. the panels. That's the rationale. Well, the rationale seems to be stretched farther and farther each year, and uh, you know I'm getting this vision in my naivete of the uh, street tax revenue fund as a giant piggy back piggy bank and with the city's department managers circling around it hammers in hand looking for ways to uh, allocate those funds to their projects however tentative the connection to transportation might be that's why I ask these questions okay uh, f finally um, I've noticed that all of the projects in the uh, CIF, that's the Transportation Community Investment Fee Fund, that those are all transportation projects with transportation prefixes for their project numbers. Um, why aren't any CIF funds used for building renovations? So the Transportation Community Investment Fund is has some pretty clear uh, restrictions um, in its use. Uh, primarily, it is to be used uh, only on arterial roadways for capacity improvements. Uh -huh. um, that is set in the city's financial policies that um, are part of the budget each year. Um, so um, it has not been changed in the six years I've been here. So um, that's the uh, pretty much the guidelines we follow. Mm -hmm. All right. Speaking of guidelines, and since you mentioned those clear restrictions on the CIF funds, I uh, went into the um, city website and I found the section of the code of ordinances that was adopted after the street tax revenues were voted in. And it's section 4.04.130. And uh, it reads in part under uh, part B, all revenues derived from the three quarter cent increase approved. And then it references various ordinances that authorized the uh, street tax and renewed the street tax shall be allocated to a special public improvement fund as contemplated by section 9.9 .9 of the charter designated the street system maintenance and improvement fund which shall exist solely to fund operations maintenance rehabilitation and improvement of the city transportation system that's the end of my quote so that's when i started thinking about uh, what a stretch it is perhaps to fund all these building improvements with street tax revenues. And that's, that's it for my questions and comments. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to say that you all are, of course, very detailed, and I appreciate that. Um, but I also want to mention that um, council appreciates the data before we make decisions. So there may be times where uh, a project may be, be on hold because we may be asking more questions. We need to see um, what does that look like? Uh, 
you know, so that data is very, very, very important for council. Um, also, I believe maybe feel if we can have Jim or Molly to come to talk about the the street fund, the street tax um, fund so that they can answer all those questions, because I think that that I remember you asking that last year. So I think it's important that we have someone from that department to come in and be able to answer those questions. Um, and then finally, I just want to mention that, well, not finally, but we do have priorities. And so those priorities for council um, because of development, because of housing, because of those council priorities that are up there, um, that's basically what staff is going off of. And so although everything is important, 100% important and needed, um, staff are directed by council to, um, uh, they are obligated to go with what council priorities are. So everything on here, definitely missing sidewalks, <laughs> very important because I hate to get cut off without a sidewalk myself. But um, if that's not what's next in line, because I do know moving forward, pretty soon council will be asking what projects are not done, how long ha have they been in the queue, how much have been, um, how much have already been done, um, if not, we want the projects have, that have already been started to be completed. And that's very important, right? And so when you see these partially funded or some of these projects that's moved out for later years is because we need our priorities completed. And we also want to know the ones that are not completed that has been started, where are we? What's the status on that? So that's very important too because our constituents are asking those questions as well and so we're like we don't know so that is you know about to be coming up from council as well if not council Shakita Yarrow um, then I guess I want to say that vision zero will answer a lot of these questions that's why we're that's why we adopted vision zero to make sure that these projects are following our priorities for our city, our safe priorities for our city, our pedestrians, our bike, our cyclists and everything. And so that will determine if they are on the right track with these projects. And so sometimes they may have to pull them back because it's not in alignment, in alignment with Vision Zero. And that is why council adopted this because it's so important to make sure that these streets, like we don't have, do we really need eight lanes, right? And so Vision Zero and our consultants will look over that and say, how can we um, make this more safe? So I love, you all are just on it, I love it. But I also want to give you some context of what council is looking at and what we're looking for from staff as well. So although sometimes they can answer questions and sometimes they can't tell you everything and sometimes I don't know nothing. So, but I do know that what our priorities are and how we have to be in, in alignment with our priorities and also with Vision Zero that's coming up, we have to support that, we adopted it. Um, so that's very important and why sometimes some of these projects are being pushed out further because of that. Um, did I say that right, Phil? Or am I lying? You know? No, <laughs> no just kidding. All right. So if you have any questions about that, anything that I said, just, you know, let me know afterwards and we could talk about it. Thank you for the presentation. Um, for these improvements um, for the roadways, um, would it be including a, a lane that would um, begin and then merge after the intersection? Or is it a lane that goes all the way through? Typically with the intersection improvements that we've been talking about so far tonight, it really is about a lane that then merges back into traffic. And so it's about getting the traffic through the intersection shortening some of the turn lanes 
as well. When we're talking about triple turn lanes, we're talking about not adding any length or shrinking the length of those turn lanes so we can fit the vehicles that were using it into a smaller distance and then getting them through and then having them merge as they come into traffic. So we are trying to doing what you're saying. <laughs> I'm trying to merge. Yeah. Has there been any studies on the intersections that have those? So uh, like Hover and Nelson, there's one there. A lot of people don't use that. Or Sunset and 119, um, a lot of people don't use it because they're scared to merge. Is there a study or data that shows the intersections that do have those merge lanes, the, the usage of those? Well, there are studies you know, every time we have some development come in, we always ask for a study that looks at those specific qualities of the, what's going to change as far as, uh, or what's needed as far as that project goes if we're adding traffic to an intersection or or, or a street. So um, we do have those studies, but we don't, for, for a lot of these, um, well, I mean, for a lot of them, we actually do have the studies that were part of the design, so the design does get that as well. But, and a, I'm kind of on the fence because sometimes the merge is a good way to get the traffic through. And then I'm thinking about Nelson as we're heading west. And we had the conversation about why would you widen that road when it's it goes against some of the Vision Zero ideals? It's because you have a merge lane that gets kind of dangerous. And, you know, how do we get the traffic safely through? And so sometimes we have to kind of do those balancing acts of whether it's a merge lane or whether it's not. So... Uh, that's one of those that's one of those instances where we've we're trying to balance it do you widen the roadway add buffered bike lanes as part of that and still have uh, the traffic getting the traffic that you need to get through that intersection thank you and then for roundabouts how many roundabouts does the city operate right now Yeah, we tried to count them out the other day, uh, uh, Cammy and I, I think, and we, I think we came up with seven. And is there a study about traffic flow and safety on those six? There's a, uh, well, um, I'm not sure if, I don't think we have studies specific to that, but we know anecdotally that uh, the roundabouts are safer as far as having uh, fewer, you know, yeah, fewer conflict points as well as less uh, of the head-on and the right or the um, T-bone type crashes. They're more of the side swipe and they're much less uh, dangerous. We're taking away the kinetic energy and you'll hear about that uh, coming up in the next piece. Sure. And then for the uh, TRP-098, um, the Highway 66 improvements, is that expected to reduce accidents on Highway 66? Is that the, the purpose? I think the approach for TRP 098 is, is a balanced approach, is trying to make improvements for all modes of transportation, pedestrians, adding capacity, particularly turn lanes for vehicles, and on-street bike lanes making improvements. So to say it, it, there's a, a significant reduction, I can't really say that, but we think there's benefits being provided for all modes. And is there anything uh, in the plan to lower the speed of Highway 66? Because a lot of people don't go the speed limit, and there's a lot of high-speed accidents. That would be up to the Colorado Department of Transportation, ultimately. I mean, we can make that recommendation as the city because we do border on both sides, but uh, it would be ultimately up to the owner of the roadway, as with Main Street, as with 119. Understood. Thank you. That's all the questions I had. Thank you very much. I want to thank um, all the council or board members up here for um, their detailed questions. And I echo uh, Council Member Yarbrough in conversation about what the council is, is asking to do <clears throat> and prioritize. I kind of have a general comment, I suppose, and it does have to do with this widening of, of roads at intersections. And I have worked in the transportation industry, so I do know this, that when you widen roads, you increase speed. That's just the basic principle. Um, and through all this, and I know that we're still at the beginning of Vision Zero, and I noticed in um, TRP 124, 123, and 137, as well as 
the one TRP-011, which I think is the TSM, there's not one line about decreasing speed, red light cameras. We now know that Fort Collins is going to do radar cameras up there. When are we going to start to address that speed is probably one of our most kind of whatever insidious factor in all these things that we're talking about when we talk about safety? Um, Councilmember Karkofer just mentioned Highway 66, and, and I realize that CDOT owns that, if you will. But when are we going to start addressing the speed component? Because if you do, for example, an overpass on Hover coming from Boulder Inn, we all know how fast people drive on Y19, right? And we know how quickly when they come into town, how fast they're going, right? When are we going to address that? whether it's through Vision Zero or in the CIP funding to say enough is enough, we need to start looking at this from a holistic standpoint of speed within the city because you would eliminate possibly, maybe not all, but a percentage of rear ends if on Hover, as an example, I know this is radical, 30 miles an hour, right? That would eliminate probably a fair amount of the, the rear ends. And I know you're talking about in terms of the storage that you have in those intersections and, and folks in the gaps. Um, but I, I realize that's going to take a little bit more of an effort than just us and, and, and our CIP. But I think that's just still something that's that kind of, to me, is like the unknown villain in all this is the is the speed and addressing the speed component of, of what we have. So that's my, I guess, comment. Uh, don't have a really a question around that. So uh, but thank you all for answering everything and sitting through all this, because it, I know it was a lot of information. So you're asking us for a recommended action that we request a move to approve the recommended CIP project list to city council for adoption. And I know at the beginning, um, uh, Mr. Street, you mentioned we had two options. We could make recommendations on any of these if we wanted to. So um, I would say, for example, the Hover intersection, I agree with the board. I think the prevailing attitude is, is that we don't want to see anything done in Hover in terms of widening. Um, and again, I realize that trying to make changes to the CIP is kind of like turning the Titanic at this point. But um, what, what options do we have here in regards to these projects to uh, make any recommendations? I would say you have so, somewhat of a clean slate. If you have certain items that stand out, you're more than welcome. I think it's appropriate if you make those recommendations. You could also make recommendations that are more of a broader brush policy commitment, as you stated earlier. So if you want to go through line by line, I'm not sure that makes as much sense as making those broader policy statements about what you want the CIP to look like in the future. And that passes on to city council. I can see us going through each one of these projects and saying, hey, we don't want lanes here. But um, that, that's just a suggestion to make this maybe a little bit more of a policy. Agreed. Um, I, I would make a motion that first off, no more widening to increase capacity of cars. If we're going to widen a road, it's going to be increasing capacity for vulnerable road users. Do do we have any questions or any comments around that? Okay. Okay. Um, I think also there should be maybe a um, emphasis on looking at intersections and roundabouts and the feasibility of said roundabouts. Do we have anything else in regards to over, and, and I appreciate that, Phil. I think over, kind of over the top is, is probably pr pretty good. Um, and at all possible, when we're talking about where we have streets and we're doing road diets, um, and I know we addressed that with the asphalt uh, program as well as some of these others, is separated bicycle facilities. Also, looking at green boxes, have we looked at those? We have, and we're proposing those on the very north end of Kaufman at 9th, so northbound Kaufman. 
So could the overarching theme in CIP, with the CIP, and I know that Vision Zero is going to address this, but talking about reversing the pyramid and saying, let's look at VRUs first, and then let's look at vehicles. Mm -hmm. Would that be another? Okay. Anything else that anybody else can add? Um, just that last comment you made, Chair Laner, we might uh, put that in terms of the objectives stated in the Transportation Mobility Plan as proposed, that the city is going to flip that mode hierarchy that's been in place for so many decades in Longmont that puts motorists first and vulnerable road users later. Um, that might be a good way to couch our through. recommendation yeah. to council. I agree. Yeah, that would include like next yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yes, I was just wondering if we wanted to also address any of uh, McInerney's uh, board member McInerney's concerns about um, the use of maintenance improvements and the so uh, the solar projects. If there was any comments you wanted, so I I do. I think um, I think uh, Councilmember Yarbrough um, addressed that in regards to we should probably have somebody come in from City Finance um, to discuss because really staff is following policy. It's the policy that's set forth. And so the justification for that really is not coming from them. It's coming from much higher up finance uh, and, and city management. So I think it would be appropriate that, that if we do anything, we would say either put a hold on those, maybe separate those, and then have a discussion about those, and then move forward with that as appropriate. I guess if we were making recommendations to council, I would just uh, ask council to confirm that those municipal building renovation projects conform to the uh, the code restrictions for the use of street tax funds. And you know, I trust council to uh, abide by municipal ordinances. Okay, I think that's it. Did, did you get all that? I know we threw a lot at you. Well, we got it all. So you made a motion. You made four or five, four motions, I think, and the last one is more about abiding by the, the codes. So yes. I didn't hear any seconds, and I didn't hear any votes. So Okay, we can do that. That's the so next we have piece our of four this. We have our four motions. Um, let's just take all four of them, and can I get a second on that? I will motion and we'll add those four motions that we have already <laughs> referenced um, as a recommendation to council to add to the CIP. All those in favor say aye. Okay. I do have one thing to add, and not directly directly at you, Jim, but third, ninth, and Boston all have delays from the west to the east. What's going on? <laughs> okay, um, so we've got action item um, seven. And, and A covered, Phil, is that correct? Yes. Yes. You take Fantastic. care of that, so thank you. Okay. So we can move on to the uh, TMP, the Transportation Mobility Plan, along with the Vision Zero update. Great. We'll get moving right away here. I'm going to ask um, that Carly uh, Seif from Fair and Piers and Cami come down and take the spots where Tom and Aaron were sitting, and we'll uh, take off from there. We're just going to do a quick presentation for you, 
and then uh, certainly take your questions. Again, this is an information item. You'll be seeing the transportation mobility plan coming back to you probably in December-ish time frame. We'll say winter, just to be safe. And then uh, the Vision Zero, you'll hear about that schedule and the tra trajectory that that's currently on as well. So we'll get started here right away. Again, I'm Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planning Manager with the city. Project manager, project manager for this project as well from the city side, working with Carly Seif from Fair and Pierce. Just to give you an idea of what we're going to be talking about, it really is the transportation mobility plan at this portion, and then we're going to talk about Vision Zero, kind of where we've been with both projects and where we're going with both, both projects, and how we're going to integrate the two plans together. I think that's pretty cre pretty critical, pretty key, and it's important that you understand uh, this as well. And I will just caveat this all by saying we took this to council last Tuesday. <laughs> um, I think you missed it, council members, Yarrow, because you... Oh, you were there. Sorry. <laughs> I'm getting too tired here. So um, we'll just go on with our timeline, the idea that we're thinking about uh, where we're at right now. As you can see, we've already gone through our phase one piece of that project, of this project. And phase two is really where we're in right now. We're talking about the draft recommendations for the walking, biking, transit, and driving. And you'll see that, that we flipped it so that walking is first and the highest priority in our minds, biking, then transit, then driving. So prioritize the list of capital improvement projects will be part of this. So you'll see in the next, hopefully, iteration of the CIP next year that you'll see more criteria and more things that go into ranking those projects. So we'll have a better sense of what goes first and how that happens. Also, with the public engagement, we've been capturing feedback. We've had some out outreach pieces. You'll hear about more of that in the presentation. And then winter again, we'll be coming back to the city council for this. And I'll hand it over to Carly. Great. Thanks, Phil. So just to summarize what we heard during our first phase of outreach. So we had over 1,000 touch points from the community virtually in person at Intercept events. So we made sure to take a broad reach uh, to gather community input to hear from a broad cross section of the community. So I'll just summarize some of the key themes of what we heard and how we've incorporated that feedback into our draft recommendations. So we asked people to drag and drop pins and lines on a map to identify where they had challenges walking, biking, accessing transit and driving. And we've looked at the, a heat map of those comments. What are the locations where we saw the highest density of concerns or challenges in traveling by certain modes? And we've used that to inform our recommendations for each of the modes that we'll talk through in this, this presentation. Uh, we also heard kind of consistent themes that we, we've talked about earlier in the, the last presentation on the CIP is a prioritization for um, creating infrastructure and programs to help make walking, biking, and transit safer and more convenient. Um, so with that, similarly, when we get to project prioritization, that kind of flip of the modal hierarchy will, will be important. Um, kind of consistent with that, a focus on overcoming those barriers to walking, biking, and tra taking transit. So that's not just through infrastructure, but programmatic recommendations as well. And then lastly, we had feedback on the vision and goals that we crafted um, together that you all saw the last time we came in front of you. And each of those goals will then be tied to a performance measure, and that performance measure will be used to help inform the project prioritization. So a really data-driven and community-based project process to um, develop that project prioritization list. So I'll walk through each of the modes, talk about what the goal is for that mode, and then the recommendation coming out of the TMP. So for sidewalks, it's to fill gaps in sidewalks and to upgrade places where sidewalks are deficient or don't meet ADA standards. So we've developed a prioritization um, in order to, as funding becomes available, help inform the city as to where to fill in those sidewalk gaps and to make those upgrades. So this prioritization process is based first on what are the streets with the highest volumes and the highest speeds and where transit is, so helping get people to access bus stops more safely and more conveniently. Um, and then next is going down to streets that are not arterials where there are transit routes. And then the tier after that are streets that have provide access to key destinations. So the community is helping inform that um, list of destinations such as parks, uh, bus stops, trails, uh, community recreation centers, libraries. And then after that are non-arterial streets that access key destinations and then everything else. 
On the biking side, the goal is to make it comfortable and convenient to bike through Longmont for all ages and abilities. So we've used a level of traffic stress methodology to make sure that we're addressing users that are more interested but concerned bicyclists um, and to upgrade existing bike facilities that might exist today but might not be comfortable for ages 8 to 80. And then to add bike facilities in places where there are gaps in the system. So here's a, a very draft map of the bike facilities that we've identified. So locations where we want to upgrade. So we've identified that proposed facility type that feels more appropriate given the speed and the volume of streets, and then identified locations for new bike facilities as well. Two different facility types that we're recommending as a part of this network are protected bike lanes, the image on the top right, for higher volume, higher speed streets, where we want to have a vertical buffer between people biking and people driving in order to create that increased protection. And then neighborhood bikeways, so the picture on the bottom, where we have low volume, low speed local streets, where it feels comfortable for people biking to share the road with people driving. We understand in order to create that experience and make it comfortable for all ages and abilities, we need additional treatments at intersections especially um, to make sure that you know, that experience is, is comfortable. Um, so things like mini traffic circles, flipping stop signs, uh, striping and signage. And then on the transit front, um, improving transit within Longmont. And really the focus here is on fixed route transit on corridors in the city. So we're acknowledging that there's a lot of great regional investments happening today. Um, BRT to Boulder, First in Maine, Kaufman Street Busway. There's also a lot of great investments on the, the hyper-local side, so on the neighborhood scale of microtransit. The gap in transit in Longmont are going to be fixed route Core, additional fi corridors for fixed route transit. Um, these are more cost effective ways to move people in Longmont and create those connections that are missing today. And then the other recommendation for transit is focused on improving span and frequency. So uh, you can see in the bar chart that w the top two um, barriers to using transit that we heard from the community are that the bus doesn't come early and late enough, so expanding hours, um, and then that the bus doesn't come frequently enough. And then coverage actually came third. So that is to the point of um, those fixed route corridors. Uh, so next step, so some of you, were, you heard about the open house. We had a lot of attendees and some really great feedback um, a couple of weeks ago. The online survey is continuing to be open for another couple of weeks. So we already have a large number of responses to the online survey that mirrors the in-person open house for those who weren't able to make it. Uh, we've gone to a number of different focus groups. We went to our center. Uh, we'll be going to ECAT um, in a couple of weeks. And so having more targeted conversations with smaller groups across the city. And then lastly, we'll be at the farmer's market um, this weekend to, to get in front of community members who uh, maybe are less likely to attend an open house. So all of this feedback we're collecting from the community is going to go to hone recommendations um, that we've been drafting up and then to prioritize those recommendations with wrapping up the plan end of the year. So I'll hand it over to Cammie to talk about Vision Zero. Great, hello all, thank you for having us tonight. Let me get here. Um, I know you have heard a lot about Vision Zero already and I know your supporters, so thank you. I just wanna say you were all asking the right questions and it was so nice to listen to the prior conversation. And I think rest assured Vision Zero, just to echo what Councilwoman Yarbo said, we will address a lot of them. I think through this combined process of the TMP update, as well as the Vision Zero action plan, um, we are definitely getting to it all. We just can't get to it fast enough in our brains. We all wish it was done already, so working on it. But as you know, we're here since uh, because the city has adopted the goal to reduce our fatal and serious injuries to zero by 2040. That was adopted last year. I started about six months ago. Um, and so we have been working on getting a lot of the pieces in place to launch some of the things that you all are talking about and waiting for to happen. So I'm going to spend the rest of the presentation letting you know what we've been doing and what's about to happen. Um, this is probably not new to some of you, but just in case, um, as you were mentioning, kind of flipping the pyramid, putting vulnerable road users on top, sort of having um, 
cars not be as centered in the transportation system, but rather pedestrians and bicyclists and vulnerable road users. This just sort of shows the difference between what might have been a traditional transportation management system, but the city is definitely already on the path and has been and will continue to move towards what we're calling as the safe system approach to traffic management. Just to get into that in a little more detail, the safe system approach is how we will do Vision Zero. It's how we'll sort of operationalize um, and categorize and talk about things moving forward. So to um, board member Lehner's comment, safer people, safer vehicles, the sort of colored pie pieces you see, so you'll see safer speeds as one of them. We have just recently in the last few weeks internally came up with how are we going to organize our internal structure to talk about all of these pieces through our center of excellence. There's a number of center of excellence within Longmont that you may have heard about. One of them is actually a camera center of excellence. So the camera discussion is already in progress. We're joining up with that. We will be bringing members of most departments, most teams, whenever it makes sense, into the envision envision work groups on each of these bucket areas internally and we'll mimic that with the public as well through the task force now that we have wonderful dylan on board we are going to be putting together our calendars and getting it planned for when can we launch our first task force and invite members into that so i expect within the next month or so the first communication is going to go out about getting interested members ongoing and starting that task force work since we started, we've been collecting names and we have probably a list of 30 to 40 community members that already want to be a part of that task force. So that's great. I encourage you to become part of the task force if you would like to. We can make sure you have the link um, to sign up for our interest form if you would like to be because that will that's what's developing our email list. We have been growing our relationships and meeting people and talking with people just to spread the word about the upcoming task force with all of the different vulnerable road user groups that we can identify. Dylan and myself are going to continue that work. So part of this is getting our, what we've been doing is getting our um, community engagement plan pulled together. So when we actually launch, we also have the data that you've all been speaking about. We've been running some additional data analyses above and beyond the wonderful crash report that staff was already producing to sort of look at the crash data in additional ways because we know we're going to be asked specific questions about our vulnerable populations. So we wanted to make sure we kind of sliced and diced the available data by those groups so we could start having those conversations and we were ready with that data. Um, Phil mentioned earlier that one of the key points, and I think this is a guidepost that most of you will resonate with, and let me please let us know and me know if you don't, but the only way we're going to get to zero is really is if we reduce the severity of crashes. If we reduce the severity of crashes, we will, do, we will reduce the severity of injury. Kind of a you know, logical theory behind that. So when we're looking at projects, and all of the projects that Tom and Aaron talked about that are already on, in the CIP list and maybe will be in the CIP list moving forward, one of the things that Vision Zero is going to add to the already prioritization um, discussions and matrices that are already there is how are we reducing kinetic energy in any of the proposed improvements we're talking about. And if you go back and look at the circle down in the corner, the colorful circle, um, one of the things that we will also be talking about, right, is safe road users, safe vehicles, safe speeds, safe roads, post-crash care. All of that's going to be data-driven. And then how, where are we now with our fatal and serious injury rates? Kind of propose a set of packaged deals. So it needs to be like redundancy in safety countermeasures, not just one, but multiple safety countermeasures applied, probably at a lot of our high-risk, uh, whether they're segments or intersections. But we'll also be looking at the data post-intervention to see, are those fatal and serious injury rates going down? So speaking to your point about being data-driven, we'll have that sort of system in place moving forward of how do we look at the data before the intervention? How do we do it after? I'm sure that's already going on on some level, but we'll, we'll try to operationalize it under, with the Vision Zero lens being looked at as far as what vulnerable road users were impacted before intervention versus after. Not just did total crashes go down or did FSI go down, but really who's involved and what's going on and what's behind the nature of these crashes. 
Part of the data that we've been doing in the past six months is we've developed using the existing crash data, trying to look at this as a density map of where are all of our fatal and serious injury crashes occurring. So looking at just 2017 to 2022 data, this shows you the brightest spots, the yellow spots are where most of our fatal and serious injury crashes are occurring. These are probably not a surprise to any of you where these are occurring lines up with what we already know, why the projects are already on the CIP list that are there, what projects are coming up in the new TMP update. And the Vision Zero Action Plan is just going to add to this and get more specific beyond what the TMP is going to recommend as well. Another layer that we've created is our high injury network. So these are all of the roads and or streets within the Longmont network that have had a fatal or serious injury occur on them. So just to help you read it, it's very busy, but if there's a red dot, that is a fatal injury from 2017 to 2022. If it's sort of that orangey color, that is a serious injury. And so the roadway is highlighted all the way from beginning to end if it had one of those on there. Identifying our high injury network will help us also layer on other equity layers, things like where are schools, where are senior citizen housing developments, where are food sites. We could look at things a number of different ways and identify are they on our high injury network. I wanted to point out the blue purpley blocks behind the data are also using census data to identify our most underserved communities using federal database sources. There are also Longmont database sources that might slightly differ, but based on some funding that we've gone for, which I'll tell you about in just a second, um, these were the areas that the feds have identified using a number of different matrices to say why these are our underserved communities. So we sort of identified them as our Vision Zero zones. As you mentioned, Vision Zero doesn't have a ton of money yet. Once we have a Vision Zero action plan, we will it will open up the doors for us to get more money so we can leverage the limited city dollars better. But being able to say that we are addressing our Vision Zero zones and those who need it most and maybe who have been most, most historically underserved and that we're prioritizing these areas, as well as looking at system-wide approaches. So we'll have the project-based approaches as well as the system-wide approaches when we start identifying possible projects. We'll have both. We'll be able to say that we know we are serving our under-resourced communities, which is going to open up us being, us being able to access more money through grants. The Vision Zero Action Plan by the feds has outlined these are the eight components that are needed in an action plan, which will set us up for federal dollars as well as state dollars. We have already begun and pretty much have a draft of the first three sections already done. We will bring this to our task force to review it with them. We've already started work on the other sections highlighted with the yellow check marks. They're not done yet. That will be part of what the task force will do, will help us complete these sections. And when we get to the completed version of a Vision Zero Action Plan, we will bring it to you, or a draft version, to review it. We'll kind of go through the same process the TMP is. We'll bring it to council sort of for first review and second review, and we'll eventually hopefully have it adopted. But the task force is going to help us work through the rest of that process. Just so you know, we're following data-driven um, solutions. There are 39 already proven safety countermeasures. The feds are putting out more. They're testing all of these new approaches that are prioritizing peds and bikes. They are pushing them out as fast as they can to all the municipalities working on Vision Zero and or safety or complete streets. So we are going to be able to absorb all of that information and apply it to possibly um, our updated policies, our updated standards, all of the work that we'll go through over the next year or two to get City Longmont um, kind of baked, the visions are sort of baked into all of the guiding documents that we need to do. And so Phil is going to talk about how we're going to feather these two plans together a little bit more, but that is the intention, is that I will build off, the, the Vision Zero Action Plan will build off where the TMP leads off, and we're going to keep going with the details. Great. Thanks, Cammie. Yeah, the uh, the TMP, we really look at that as developing that high vision or that high level of vision for multimodal travel. So that's really the big picture piece of this. Vision Zero dives deeper into that safety and equity 
pieces, as, as you know. And both plans are going to be data-driven and community-based. You've seen that in what we've talked about so far. And both plans make a long lot more competitive for that external funding. Once we get the action plan done for Vision Zero, that other communities have already seen a, a huge benefit to that with intersection pieces. And then the next slide. So again, just to reiterate, the TMP identifies that roadmap. Well, v v Vision Zero gets us there safely is what we kind of like to say. And the Vision Zero will provide those details on the transportation system safety, prioritizing initiatives, benefiting severe injury locations and vulnerable road users. You've seen that in the maps. Um, it'll also add additional policies, projects and programming and additional project prioritization criteria. So that'll add on to what we're doing with the TMP already with the, with the criteria there. So with that, we'd open up to any questions that you might have knowing that it's about eight o'clock. <laughs> so. Thank you. I don't really have any questions, but I'm very happy about the action plan has started because when we before we adopted and I got all that information from the feds when um, we went to uh, D.C., um, that action plan is so crucial in order to get that funding and it will be much smoother with the action plan. So it makes me happy to know that you all are so far in advance right now um with the action plan and you have you already have your task force build you're building your task force of people in within the community um and i see that there is growing um the plan and everything as well so i just want to say thank you so much for um getting that going and having that community input getting the task force already uh getting them ready because they emphasize that um, in D.C. over and over again, you have to have a solid action plan. So it makes me happy to see that you all have that because I think the funding will just roll in once uh, once it's completed. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you for saying that. Essentially, if you don't have a version of a transportation safety plan, you will quickly become ineligible for funding. Our Vision Zero Action Plan will act as our transportation safety plan. So to your point, we will be set up and ready to apply for additional funding. And I forgot to mention, we already did apply for $1.2 million. We should be hope hearing and then within a matter of days, we keep saying that. Um, but the next round of applications is due at the end of this month, August 29th. So we should hear about our application, which went in a prior round before August 29th. And that will fund our Vision Zero Action Plan, though we did not want to wait until we went under contract with the feds, because we know that could take a while, which is why we are ahead of the game and going to start our task force in advance. And it will fund some additional studies, as well as hopefully get us some new cameras that will actually improve the quality that Kyle has identified, getting some better cameras to help us detect things like near misses and some better data, we apply to get some additional cameras for the city so we can just, you know, stay, get caught up and stay caught up with the advancing technology. So some good stuff in our, I wish I could have come tonight to tell you we already found out about the plan, but we're expecting good news hopefully in the next two weeks. And uh, I'll give some information about that technology at uh, the next month's meeting along with some traffic signal updates. Perfect. Um, I just have a couple of uh, feedback items on the bike map. Can I? Can we go back to that? Yes, I'm good to back. And I have to say that I'm also very excited about everything that you presented today. So everything is moving in the right, right direction. I'm thrilled that Vision Zero is already underway, and uh, we're making these hopefully great strides in the very near future increasing safety. Um, so I'm, I'm sure some of this is based on the map that the BIC submitted to the TMP. Um, but I'm just wondering why uh, or if it's possible to amend 17th and 9th to have protected bike lanes uh, through the whole thing, or if there's a reason why they're not protected all the way through on both west side and east side, depending on which one it is. Because it's changed from protected to side path. 
Yeah, we can definitely look into feasibility a little bit of it was the curb to curb with and the cost associated with implementing a PBL if it can't fit within that curb to curb with. So the exercise we're going through now is identifying the trade off required in order to implement a PBL, acknowledging sometimes it's removing parking, sometimes it's removing a center turn lane and sometimes a travel lane. So we can look into um, kind of if that extent were to be extended, what the trade offs would be. Okay. Yeah, because it. In, in terms of like making a really connected mm -hmm. network, having it end halfway through the city doesn't make it very connected and moving, going from a protected bike lane to a side path is not really an ideal situation because then you're suddenly dealing with little driveways and mm -hmm. you know, you, it becomes a safety issue at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Mountain View, um, currently part of it is already a, a buffered bike lane. I would... Uh, I'd love to see it moved up in status to a protected bike lane instead. Since there's already the space for doing a buffered, I, I'm just wondering why it's not already protected in the plan. Mm -hmm. That's one we can look into too. Sometimes it's just number of driveways. When you lose that vertical buffer for every driveway, um, it can, can a become less intuitive. Oh, that's a good point, yeah. Yeah, Mountain View is a collector street, so mm -hmm. it does have the driveways more than an arterial. Um, I'm kind of disappointed that there's not a better plan for Hoover. It's pretty much relying on the side paths, which are less than ideal or not even existing at this point in some sections. And there's doesn't seem like there's a plan to make a proper connection for a bike or really pedestrians along that whole uh, route, really. Like there's just relying on side paths, which are either not there or really narrow or you have to go through a million intersections where you're contending with a bunch of traffic from cars. So I don't know if there's a reason why you decided not to make that a, a actual proper bike through lane and for pedestrians and bikes, but it's, I don't know, it, it seems like it's an oversight in my opinion, since it's such a major route for everyone to go through and there's not many good north-south routes in that one already. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's when we can look as well about the trade-offs associated with upgrading that facility. Okay. And um, I, w I always look at like trying to connect the different trails and the different greenways to each other. And there seems like there's a, a missing link between um, St. Vrain and um, Spring Gulch and the, up to, um, South Martin. And going up South Martin is never very fun. Um, I do it pretty much every day. And um, there is definitely a connection, especially at the Ken Pratt so South Martin Street um, intersection right there, trying to connect between the Greenway to Greenway between those two. And right now that's not really a protected bike lane or even a good route because it gets really dicey in there. So... Mm -hmm. If maybe you could kind of look at that route as well, just to connect those two routes because they're so close together, but yet they're so far apart. Um, yeah, and I don't know if the, in, there's a plan to put in um, bike parking facilities, especially if within like the main part of Lamont. Um, right now, it's just like you know the what you call like the U bolt things. What you, whatever you call those things. Um, but like actual... We call like, inverted use, yes. Yes, inverted use, I guess so. <laughs> um, but actually like a place where, like similar to like on Kaufman, where you can actually lock up your bike in a protected place. Mm -hmm. Right now there's really nothing in the middle of Longmont for... And presumably we're going to have a lot more bicyclists when this network actually happens. So maybe incorporating some bike parking in that network. So you're mm -hmm. kind of thinking about where people are going to be actually parking. I think, too, that becomes maybe more of a policy statement again, okay. an overriding policy statement about, you know, to incentivize bike use, and that would be part of it. I don't know. This plan isn't meant to take that detailed level of where will the bike parking, the smaller bike parking go, but certainly the bigger pieces I think we can add. Yeah, like presumably lots of people are going to go to Main Street, so having somewhere for people to safely park their bikes um somewhere along main street seems like an obvious spot um yeah so but otherwise i'm really excited about the additions on the trails like obviously there's been a lot of additions and 
I'm really excited about this net- network. I hope it happens tomorrow, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I understand it's going to take many years, but this is really great to see. So thank you. Okay. Thank you for your feedback. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm very impressed with what I've uh, seen and heard tonight, uh, Carly and Cami. So keep up the good work. I look forward to future updates from you. When I was looking at the map that showed those blue and purple blocks, it occurred to me that if you had data that identified neighborhoods in Longmont with lots of people who don't have access to vehicles, or sometimes they're called transit dependent households that might be really useful for you do you have that data great question and yeah and just for an additional point of clarification dylan's going to be working in community and neighborhood resources so not on transportation planning and we're going to work together so with his connections and his team and carmen's work of having robust connections to all of the neighborhoods already, we're gonna be able to leverage that data. But yes, we do have the data on non-transit cars or households already, but then being able to have Dylan be housed in community neighborhood resources and then us housed in transportation planning, and I think it's just a brilliant plan. We'll be able to bring resources for both departments to help with that robust community engagement and really get in with the relationships that this department has already developed with communities to really get into where their key destination is and what are their needs and what's challenging them in their existing environment and how can we make that better for them. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. This was great. Um, if you can go back to the slide with the RTD uh, survey. Um, so with with the survey about buses not running early or late enough or not frequently coming, um, how do we propose to RTD? Because we can't expand service. Uh, what do we do to um, suggest to RTD to expand service for uh, what the citizens are, are saying? Well, I guess my kind of snide answer is we put our money where our mouth is. And so if we provide the dollars or if this community wants to provide more dollars to the transit, that would be one way to incentivize RTD to provide better service. The other piece would be to pull out some of our dollars of that service and go to a different provider, a provi private provider, if RTD would let, you know, RTD has to buy in on that. But we are doing some things right now working toward um, trying to get more of our dollars from RTD to be able to do our what we need to do as communities and not have, quite frankly, folks in Denver trying to de design a system in Longmont or Boulder or, or, or Castle Rock or Lone Tree. So those are the things we're looking at in the, in the, in the long-term future. Great, thank you. And for Vision Zero, how are we adapting to vehicles with self-driving? Is that something that we're considering? Is that something that um, we're starting to have data for? Excuse me, sorry, I went the wrong direction. So, good question. Um, I don't know that we, I have not seen that data yet specifically for Longmont. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I just might not know about it yet or it's something we can um, figure out how to get, but it's definitely gonna be discussed in the safer vehicles bucket. So it falls sort of in that world of the safe system. So it will be a topic that that work group internally and externally will address at the time when you know there'll be there each of these buckets has multiple categories like your time out the cameras the speed limits a lot of the topics you've already brought up this evening will get addressed by the work groups both internally and externally within these organizational buckets great thank you and then if we go to slide 19 i'm just going to state the obvious i'm not sure i know what number th that is sorry it's the the one with the purple and the the red and yellow oh the Heat map, the density map, yes. I'm just going to state the obvious. Um, it seems like where most of the fatalities are is where traffic speed is the highest. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and then for Hover, um, if you go back to the, the bicycle map. 
Sorry to make you oh, that's flip. A, no problem. So, much. Um, so there's a lot of grocery stores, Target, King Supers, Whole Foods. Uh, there's a lot of grocery or restaurants there as well. Um, and it's not inclusive for you know anything that's other than vehicles. Um, so it would be nice to have different modes of transportation available for that corridor since there's so many grocery stores and so many restaurants that we're driving a lot of traffic to. Um, and right now it's really focused heavily on vehicle traffic. I, I will add to that agree with everything you said we're pulling together where all of our food access points are in the city of Lama, and we're working with a food security network already who has already done a lot of the legwork on mapping that within Longma and they're sharing with us and they've done some individual case studies and have done some test routes with vulnerable road users within Longmont trying to access and have a set of draft recommendations for us, which is wonderful. And we are gonna be incorporating those into the TMP as well as Vision Zero and staying on their work group and working with that local community already to try to make access and multimodal options to these key destinations better in the future. So mm -hmm. you're on the right track and I think we're gonna be addressing all of it. Awesome. I would, like, I would love to see that data once once it's available. Thank you. You bet. Yes. Um, well. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your time. And um, part of what I'm wondering is, uh, so I love the collaboration and the. Uh, I hope that you get the funding for the 1.2 million dollars from the feds. Um, is there any collaboration that you're doing with other local municipalities, such as Boulder, Brighton, other bustling regions? Yes, great question. Um, so actually myself and the Vision Zero coordinator at Boulder County run a Vision Zero community partnership meeting that brings key stakeholders interested in Vision Zero together on a monthly basis. And so they also wrote a letter of support for our grant application. We support their Vision Zero work. So we're doing it from also with Dr. Cog. So Weld County, all of the surrounding counties, all of their surrounding municipalities, everyone is really working on their version of a transportation safety plan right now, whether they call it a Vision Zero plan or not. Most will, but some won't. But everybody's working on their plan right now, and we're all working together. So not only neighbor to neighbor, but sort of at the regional level, as well as most of us are working with CDOT, who is also updating their state plan to reflect all of the safety prioritization. So from the feds to the states, to regional, to local levels, we're all getting on the same page and working together and staying in contact about who's doing what. Once we have these plans written, it's gonna make it so much easier to collaborate on actual funding projects together as well. So that's one reason why we all are trying to get our action plans done quickly, because it will just make project collaboration that much easier in the future. Nice, and are there any uh, transportation um, advisory board members that are on the Vision Zero task force currently? Not that I know of yet, but I have to, I need to ask communications to send me the updated list of who right. signed up. So maybe some of you have signed up and I just haven't seen it yet. So I don't know yet. Okay. I'm assuming no, since there's no one being like I am. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. Yeah. So there's interest. Yeah. I know you expressed it. Yeah. So I'll make sure that you all get the link directly so you don't have to go looking for it. I can follow up with you all tomorrow and send you the link so you can just do it. Is there a set number of, of um, people on the task force? No. And uh, we're going to uh, need a lot of people to cover all those buckets anyway. So I figure right now, those who are interested, more than area. welcome. Yes. Yeah. Um, and. I I'd love to see that there's a the uh, that there's a proposed protected bike lane recommendation for County Line Road um, as I know that there's going to be the added um, lane or like the added um, bike lane that'll be on the North County Line Road side um, due to the the improvements that are that are being made there um, and so I was yeah I just was. I guess it's more of a comment of, yeah, just uh, stressing the importance of that because currently, especially on that ninth and County Line Road area, not only is it not protected, there's a curb that um, makes it just not feasible. And I think that thankfully I haven't seen any bicyclists on there. I tried doing it once and it was a death wish. Um, and so, um, yes, the, and then other than that, um, my, uh, I have a current concern for bicycle parking. Um, currently, the Kaufman uh, multimodal project has made it so that 
there's the bicycle parking that is already available is not currently accessible and i was wondering um, is that going to be and there's not really an adequate alternative for that like at least with uh the uh, park and ride people they, they ha can ask, access the alter alternative parkings of roosevelt park but they, i haven't seen any uh good alternatives for people that want to park their bike and i was wondering if that's going to be the case until 2027 i thought we had some access from the west side of the of the parking lot and the bike facility so i'll, I'll i can check into that and we can give you a more complete answer as part of the project make sure that we do have access because that was counted on okay cool yeah so i understand coming from kaufman's very difficult especially now and then yeah. as that project moves further south that part of kaufman will reopen and so it won't be until 2027 for that it'll yeah. just be in, like i hate to say it but another year mm -hmm. or, or less as they move south okay yeah good to know i just want to make sure that the parking is considered for bicyclists um and yeah i look forward to the follow-up on that other than that yeah thank you so much for your time uh i just had a couple of more thoughts since i've been listening to everyone else um since we're on the bicycle network i thought i'll make another comment about that um main street has absolutely no bike lane consideration right now is actually completely white and considering it's the main thoroughfare through Lomont, I know we have Kaufman Street which is awesome but that doesn't help you if you're trying to get to shops on the other side of Maine um, so I'm just wondering what's the reason because uh, I know there's some there's CIP about Main Street eventually but it's not on this map completely understand and and take your comment with um, you know we'll take note of that comment one thing to think of is that both Hover and Main Street will still need to facilitate vehicles in the near-term future and probably the mid-term future and probably the long-term future as we're talking about automated vehicles and electric vehicles. So we do need to put those vehicles somewhere and so what we're trying to do is really provide those parallel facilities and I think that's what you start to see in this map if you look more granular at it is that there are parallel facilities on both sides of Main Street, they're not clearly evident, and so we need to do a better job to make sure that people understand that what we're really trying to do is make parallel facilities that are completely separated from Main Street and not something that's kind of scabbed onto a, a street that really is facilitating automobile traffic. Okay, because I know that in the CIP there was a plan to make Main Street just a one lane on each way, so. That, yeah, and that was for the downtown, yeah. and, and we are still talking about what that looks like as a concept plan, but that's really more for the pedestrian movements. Mm -hmm. So we really do still want to keep bicycles one block on either side of that, or two blocks if you consider the east side. Emory really lends itself well to be a bicycle facility, and I think on our EMUC plan, our EMUC plan that mm -hmm. Carly also worked on with us, so uh, that was one of the pieces that we put in there as a parallel facility with Kaufman on the other side. Okay. Yeah, I mean, just as a bicyclist, it's a pain because I go to places on Main and I have to pop. Anyway, um, but I understand that. I mean, that makes sense. I mean, it's just, if only we could fit everything in. <laughs> um, my other, I guess, comment, and maybe it's not applicable, but have you been kind of thinking about the um, increased use of e-bikes and e-scooters and the fact that um, you know, if you're planning on having them use multi-use trails and you have like, you know, they're going to be increasing over and it becomes maybe a safety issue with now they're going to be sharing the space with the pedestrians who are going to go a lot slower than them. Um, so is that part, does that come in part of this conversation? Yeah, we've been in, in all the discussions we've been having with e-bike advocates, um, we've been inviting them to the task force, the Vision Zero task force, because we know this will definitely be a topic that will get addressed in there with details and recommendations and, you know, thoughts about what do we put out on trails to help increase education as well as maybe as well as maybe some sort of enforcement at some level. I mean, all of these ideas, everybody's got a lot of ideas. So we've been funneling them to the task force so we can have that that for sure guarantee sort of controlled space to have these conversations. Okay, thank you. That, that's really it now. <laughs>
And then one other, I don't think I um, said these words, but the developing associated standards. So we're obviously, we're not updating standards, but high level recommendations about where standards for different bike facility types need to be updated, acknowledging the range of different bikes and emerging mobilities and the speed discrepancy between e-bikes and people walking or um, kids learning to ride a bike. And so knowing that, you know, potentially standards for trails need to be wider with these emerging modes and different classes of e-bikes. Thinking about the policy around what e-bike classes are allowed on different facility types will be important too. Yeah, the city of Boulder has done a pretty good job with the class one, two, and three e-bikes um, and, and their trail system. So that might be a good model to take a look at. Um, my only comment is um, with the plan um, that you set forth here, I didn't really notice that there's much public safety engagement either internally as well as listed here in regards to Vision Zero and jiving with what the job of public safety is and what is their involvement in this. Good point. They are on our leadership team and will be involved in all of the safe system sort of levels. We're actually, you know, meeting with, you know, the new traffic sergeant for the city along with, he's already well connected with the work that's going on with the traffic department. He's fully engaged in being involved in the Vision Zero. So I think you'll see more of that, especially when we come with updates, we can call better attention to that. But they're absolutely critical and crucial to the conversation. We know that and those conversations have already started and will continue. So thank you for pointing that out. No, because I know it's a challenge in other communities that I've, yeah. I've had conversations with. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Um, Great. I think we're all done with comments, right? Um, Phil, anything else on information? No, thank you. Eight. Thank you for your great comments, and we really appreciate that input. And we're going to work on getting you on a task force for the uh, for Vision Zero. Well, thank you, everybody. I know it's been a long meeting, and thank you for sitting through everything. I think I'm going to pass on comments tonight because we've covered a lot, if that's okay with everybody. Okay. So all I need is a motion. Well, I guess what I'll, I will mention is the items for the upcoming agenda. The next scheduled meeting is uh, September 9th. Uh, microtransit kickoff, if the contract gets signed. It'll be signed. It'll, okay. It's got to be signed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, adaptive signal control as well as the flex bus information. Correct. Okay. So I just need to uh, get a motion to adjourn and we can. A motion to adjourn the transportation advisory board meeting for August. <laughs> need a second. I second that motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>